Hello everyone and welcome to a viewer verdict, first one we've done in a while and this time we are taking a look at Masters of the Universe Battleground, a He-Man themed miniature game by Archon Studio. Bit delayed in getting around to doing this but here we are finally with everything painted up to do the tutorial battle which is in the core rule book. There is also a, a separate book with other layouts and such. This is a smaller sized version of a full game to try and just introduce the mechanics so that's what we're going to use today for the viewer verdict and if you're not familiar really quick viewer verdict i'm going to play a new game for you here on the channel and then afterwards you can take to the comments and say whether you are for or against it being a more regular thing as part of just the general docket for the channel you can go into as much or as little detail as you want you can literally just say for or against or you can go into detail. Sometimes the creators of these games might see these comments, so the feedback might be appreciated by them. I don't know. But either way, I'll also cover just a general gist of how it's played to improve viewability. But do keep in mind this is not a how to play. Uh, this is like learning as we're going. So a game of Masters of Universe Battleground is usually 100 points, but the tutorial battle uses less characters and less gear. It works out at either side of 65 points, roughly speaking. It also uses curated fate decks, which are how you give your characters action points and mana to do their abilities, and also in some cases how you score some extra objectives to win the game. So there's five characters for each side that come in the core box, three for each side, good and evil, baddies, goodies, whatever you want to call them. And we'll just quickly go over them here. So the good side is He-Man, Man-at-Arms, Stratos. He-Man comes with the Sword of Power. Man-at-Arms comes with an arm cannon and a mace. And Stratos comes with a flamethrower. Basics of a stat card. Health, defense, mind, power, perception, toughness. I think. Actually, I think I've got strength and toughness mixed up there. Movement. Movement has a second value because you can do a focus, which lets you go faster. And then each character has two abilities. And that's about it. You can buy extra gear for them, but it adds up to how much they're worth in total points. And that does matter for one of the win conditions of the game. There's three ways to win. We'll quickly look at the baddies first, though. So the three villains taking to the field today are Skeletor, Merman, and Trapjaw. Skeletor has his Havoc Staff, which generates extra mana for him every time an uh, underling of his is... Also, these dog hairs are ridiculous. ...is wounded. And he also has the Spell Magic Blast couple of rules on his card as well. Uh, Merman has the Trident and Trapjaw starts with the Hook Attachment but he can spend one mana to transform it into a Laser Attachment so that's why I've got that saying there as well. Uh, with the Hook Attachment he's good in melee and he can kind of fire across in a straight line and drag himself along. The Laser Attachment is for ranged combat obviously. So that's the two sides that are going to go at it today. Let's take a look at the Battleground as a whole and I'll tell you the three possible ways that you can score victory points and also the two possible ways to win. This video is sponsored by Noble Knight Games. Check out the video description below for an affiliate link that will take you through to their store and it will help me out as well. Thanks. So Battleground is played on a battleground that you can see before you. It is a hex based map with modular terrain set up and the winner is either the person who tables the other person so say if He-Man and Friends wipes out Skeletor, that's an instant win, obviously. But if neither side is wiped out, it goes to victory points. And there's three ways to get victory points. First way is to take an enemy out. You get victory points equal to the cost of them plus any equipment they had. That roughly works out at 20 to 25 victory points per character, roughly speaking. Uh, some characters are cheaper than others. You can get victory points for doing secondary objectives on special kinds of fate cards for the tutorial. Each side has two and they are optional, but we'll cover these cards when they're actually getting used. But there is optional side quests that can earn victory points that way. And the third way to earn victory points is to hold an objective uncontested that was not in your deployment zone. There is five objective tokens on the map for this tutorial battle. They are the flags. You can see four of them, I believe and two of them on each side are in the deployment zone for the relative side. So the good guys are spawning down here. They're set spawn points for this tutorial battle. Their deployment ends on this hex row here. So this objective and that objective, they, they can hold them. They can stop the enemy holding them, but they don't gain any victory points for doing so. There's one smack dab in the middle of the map. Then there is one up here, and then there is one obscured 
I just move the terrain up here real quick. There's one obscured behind this terrain right here, mirrored to how this one is down here. So, get objectives, kill people, or table people, or do side quests on the fake cards, and that is how you get victory points and how you can potentially win. As I mentioned, the tutorial battle has specific setups for where everybody is deployed. There is a brief look at it, so that's where everyone will be. It is played over a series of four rounds. Prep phase, activation phase, end phase, super simple basic skirmish game stuff. And it's essentially just a bunch of dice roll-offs when you do attacks, whether it's ranged attack, close combat or not. You're rolling dice equal to some stat, usually your strength attack, say you're hitting in close combat, versus the toughness stat of the enemy. As a general rule, you're always looking for 4+, plus. it's called the scope of the attack, but there are things that make attacks harder or easier to land which might improve or make the scope worse, but that just means, say, if you were improving the scope, it goes from a 4+, plus needed to a 3+, plus. if you worsen it, it would go from a 4+, plus to a 5+. Plus. Uh, 6 is always a success, 1 is always a fail, I believe, and I think that covers the basics, so now we're going to get deployed and cover how you decide initiative and what the fate cards do. So both sides are deployed where the tutorial battle tells you to deploy them and then it comes down to working out who has priority. So the way you do that is you have your starting hand and in this case it tells you to shuffle your fate deck of 20 cards uh, curated. They have a symbol you have to look for either good or evil and take a hand of five of those plus your two uh, glory cards I think they are called which are the ones with the optional objectives on them. Then each side picks one of those cards and that is what gives the characters you choose to activate mana, action points as I've mentioned already, but it also has an initiative value on them and the highest initiative value goes first. Now those rolls are there on the off chance that they are the same initiative value. Uh, I think it says you have to pick it a different way but we're just doing a roll off. So left side is for He-Man and friends, right side is for Skeletor and friends and the way these cards look, well let's flip them over first actually to see if it is the same or not. <laughs> it is the same initiative value, so the roll-off mattered, so that actually means that Skeletor will be going first uh, via the roll-off. But these cards, they give action points, which you spend to do actions. Each general action costs one point unless it's an action you've already done, and in which case it goes up by one. So say you've already attacked, the next attack would cost you two of these, which are AP action points. They also give an amount of mana, although this particular one gives zero. And then there is a special condition. Usually you get to pick between two, but this particular card, it actually has a negative, which is minus one die to any attacks you do. So this is kind of a trade-off card. It gives you a ton of AP, but you're rolling less dice if you do attack. But it's the start of the game, so it seems like a perfect turn one, activation one card to play. The Skeletor team's card is giving 2 AP, 0 mana, and then you pick between one of these effects, either gain 1 mana or remove all mana from the character and gain 1 action point for every 2 removed, so obviously that's not going to be the one picked right at the start of the game. During a character's turn, you can play other fate cards, um, but you only get to pick between the two options at the bottom, you don't get extra stuff at the top. If that ever means you've used up all your cards and you still have characters to activate and they no longer can, they get one mana as kind of like a compensation prize for not being able to get a turn in the round. I guess you were doing more important stuff. So I think that covers it. These are the cards first being played. Obviously we'll show additional cards as they are used and how they are used and we'll get to it. So round one, Skeletor and his cronies going first. So Trapjaw activated for Team Evil and he started behind this bit of scenery here. He's gained 2 AP from the card played and 1 mana. So he spent 1 AP on a movement action. He can move 5 whether he is moving at normal speed or focused speed. Which got him to the far side of one of their objectives. But holding, he is classed as holding that right now. And the basic gist of how you hold an objective is be adjacent to the objective. Have no enemies adjacent to you or it. But it's in their deployment zone so it's not going to score them anything. That said, he spent the other AP given by that card on doing Overwatch, which is what that little cross spears thing is. That just means that he can do a reaction once someone moves into range, and on that note, he spent that one mana the card gave him to Whip and Swap, which just means he's switched to the laser attachment. So now he's got a threat radius of 12 hexes, but he's doing nothing else with his turn. That is it. Over to Team He-Man, and they have to use that card that they played. So He-Man himself activated and we're going to have to do his activation in a couple of steps because of that overwatch since it is going to get triggered. He gains mana in a different way to everybody else. He can't gain them 
from or mana tokens from fake cards at all. The way he gains mana is he gains one mana any time he gains focus. So he spent one of his four AP on focus and that gave him one mana and then he spent that focus to do, I've forgotten the term but it's a move action but you kind of go all out. So instead of moving five hexes he moves eight which got him right there. He still has three AP left but at this point that overwatch is going to trigger and he's going to get shot at so we're just going to double check how you do that it's a ranged attack though so it's not your standard strength versus toughness i believe it's perception versus maybe toughness as well we'll see so i was correct it was perception versus toughness and in most cases even in he-man's case i think most people have three toughness oh, actually no there's a couple with two Oh, Man at Arms actually has four. That's weird. He's even tougher than He-Man. That doesn't sound right. Anyway, this is where we discuss rolling off. So you roll dice equal to the stat. So Trap Trail actually has a perception of five. So he rolled five dice looking for four pluses because there was nothing influencing the scope of the attack. And he got four successes. He-Man is rolling three defense dice looking for four pluses because that's just the default, again, for the scope, unless something is influencing it. Now, sadly, he only blocked one. So this is where you can make a decision. You can spend mana on re-rolls and He-Man has superhuman reflexes, uh, sorry, I have the power, I think it is. So when he spends mana to reroll, he gets to reroll two dice. But you've got to look at it and kind of gauge what the best option is here. Because if he cancels out one success, that means there's three left. Weapons in this game have damage brackets, which we can look at here. If you have one success, this does one damage. If you have three successes, it does two damage. If you have five successes, it does three damage. So if you had two, it would still, as in two successes, it would still only do one damage. If you had four successes, it would still only do two damage. So that's kind of like the scope of how much damage these things can do. So right now it's doing two damage of He-Man's five health. With that reroll, it's possible he will block all of it. If he blocks just one more, that means two are getting through and that's only one damage. So now that I've talked it out, that probably does seem like a good idea. So he's going to spend that one mana he got from giving himself a focus token. I have the power kicks in. During any test, He Man may reroll one extra die for each mana spent on rerolls. So normally, he would only reroll one. He is rerolling two. <laughs> oh, well, that's the worst possible result. You can't reroll a reroll. So he's only blocked one. That means three successes get through, and that is two damage to him. So um, to not clutter up, well, actually, they're not that bad. There's, there's ones that denote three. We'll maybe keep the damage on the table. So that obviously is an absolutely awful start, but He-Man's turn now keeps on going because that's the Overwatch dealt with. Well, in for a penny, in for a pound. He-Man spent one AP on focus, one AP to dash eight, and he's gonna spend the last two to do another bog standard move, which is up to five, but that's just so he can stand next to the central objective. So now someone has to come and meet him, or he is gonna be holding that at the end of the turn and score 20 victory points. The man, the myth, the legend, the skeleton. Skeletor activated. Oh, by the way, it is now just back and forth until there's nobody left to activate for either side. Again, you can also run out of fake cards if you choose to use multiple in a turn. Skeletor activated and played the card that you can see there. Gave him 1 AP, 2 MP. He is also using the gain 1 MP of the special effects. He likes having a lot of MP, it's playing into their cards and potential scoring stuff later, so that's him got 3 MP now. I think he can only have 5 max, I might be misremembering. But either way, he did that and then he spent his 1 AP to walk up to this corner here. Cover does matter, as does facing. If you're attacking someone in the rear arc, then your scope is one better. So there is a reason to worry about that. But he's not doing anything else with this turn. What you're supposed to do when you finish someone's turn instantly is you turn the fake card over and put it on their card so you know you've done everything with them. Stratos activated for the goodies playing the card here, giving him two action points. No mana there, but only one choice there. He got two from that. He's pretty quick, although he's a little bit weaker. His base movement is six. So he moved from where he started to where you can see him, at which point he is spending that two mana on to the sky which is one of his activations, or special powers rather, on his card. Sometimes these cost nothing, in He-Man's case they're just passives. Sometimes they cost mana, like mostly Skeletor's cost mana for instance. Sometimes they cost a mixture of AP and mana, but to the sky is just pure mana. For, you can spend up to five and for every one spent you can jump two hexes. And with that he is soaring up to the high ground. There's benefits to being on the high ground other than just line of sight. 
Unfortunately, his flamethrower only has range 8, so there isn't much else he can do. On the off chance, he is potentially going to get hit by anything since he has one unused AP. He is going to use a focus, which is kind of the, the same thing He-Man used. That's the token for it if you end your activation with one. You can use it defensively as well, so that's what he's doing. It disappears at the end of the round, so if it's not used, it's just kind of a waste, but it gives him a bit of extra defense if someone does manage to get a shot off on him. Well, it looks like He-Man is relatively safe as Merman was the last to activate. Again, smaller game, so there's only three bodies on the field for each side. Usually, it's, you'd be expecting about five. But he played the card that you can see for two AP, took one MP from the optional rules, since the other one isn't relevant, since he can't attack this turn, he can't get into range. So he spent one AP on focus, and then spent that focus to boost his movement to eight hexes, but that did not give him quite enough to contest the objective that He-Man is holding. He stopped just in front of it. And now it's over to Man at Arms to take us to the end of round one of four. So as we look at Man at Arms' turn, I spotted an error that we did. I, I felt like there was something done a bit wrong with that Overwatch because it seemed a bit too powerful. Overwatch is an interruption, and interruptions have their scope made them more difficult by one, which meant that Trapjaw should have been hitting on fives, not fours. Now, I actually think his roll was at least one five. It might have been two, so it, it might not change anything at all if it was that good as I'm remembering it was. But just something to note, if there wasn't, at least two fives in there uh, shouldn't have done too damage to He-Man but we're going to play on as is anyway Man at Arms played this card here spent one of the two AP was given to move five out from here and for his other AP he is arming or rather using his arm cannon which has range 12 so he can reach Merman he's also taking one mana from the optional thing but not doing anything with it so he is hitting on fours because he's not doing an overwatch, it's just a standard perception versus toughness. He got two successes. Merman rolled his defense dice, I think they're about visible, and didn't get a single success. Now, he did have mana, but or one mana, which could have bought a single reroll. He's not going to, because Skeletor wants the magic, or rather, yeah, the, the magic he's going to get from his teammate getting hurt, which means two successes got through, and we can just look at the arm cannon here. See, this is the other reason why it's sometimes okay to let an attack through. One success does one damage, four success does two damage, which means two successes still does just one damage to Merman's five health. So that is the end of a round. It goes relatively quick when you're playing a smaller game, of, if you ignore all the having to explain how it works. But you remove all the tokens, so focus tokens that weren't used, you get rid of them. Overwatch, if they weren't used, you remove them. Uh, status effects, debuffs, etc. also run out at the end of a round. You collate any victory points that happen, so in this case, he-Man is holding that central objective and has scored Team Goodies 20 victory points for doing that, although it costs him um, almost half his health, which is pretty bad. At this point, you take away the fake cards that were played on every character that had them. They go into discard pile, unless it was one of the ones that had a, a glory objective on it and you achieved it, in which case you put it to one side because you scored it. And if you didn't activate any of characters and you ran out of fake cards, you give them one mana at this point. Then we go round to round two. And so a new round begins and you once again pick fake cards. Highest initiative goes first. Uh, the only other thing to mention is between the end of the last round and now you have the opportunity to draw. Well, you must draw back up to five fake cards. But prior to that, you can discard as many from your hand as you wish to try and get ones that are more apt for what you're doing. So both sides have done that. And oh, forgot to roll off in case there's the same amount. So let's hope it's not. They are not. So, a couple of things to cover here. One, it'll be Team Good Guys going first because their initiative is higher and they're doing a 3 AP card, no MP, and they also have the option to either discard a fake card to draw another one or just gain one MP. But this is one of the glory cards, so it is still used as a fake card. It gives 3 AP, 1 MP. You can also just choose to get an extra AP from it or you can choose to try and do this objective to gain 10 victory points. You must do it in the activation though. So during a single activation or interruption, use at least five mana, which is quite an ask, actually. So we'll see if that happens. So with that card, He-Man activated and tried to go all out. He used one AP to give himself focus, then the second AP to do a basic move to get face-to-face -face with Merman, the third AP to do an attack in close combat. You have to spend the focus token. It improves the scope of his attack by one, which means he was hitting on threes rather than fours, Unfortunately, he only got a 50% success rate anyway, 
Got three of them through on the defense roll, Merman blocked one, is opting not to use any rerolls because that means only two successes get through. And oh, the reason there is six dice there, not five, which is how many he man would normally roll, is he gained one mana for using that for gaining that focus token. He used the Sword of Power's special rule. You can spend up to three mana and get extra dice. So he did that, but sadly didn't work out. And if you only get two successes, it falls right in between the one success and three successes. So he's only doing one extra damage to Merman, which ain't great. Skeletor gains one mana for that happening as well. And he's not doing anything else, unfortunately. So a bit of a whiff there. He is still claiming that objective, so someone will... Oh, actually, no, he's not, because Merman's contesting him. So, no, currently he is not. So Skeletor activated for the baddies, and his goal is to try and achieve that secondary objective there to get 10 victory points which means he has to work out how to spend 5 mana in this turn. He's gaining 1 from the card as is, and 3 AP. So he went to work, he spent 1 AP and 2 mana on summon, you do a test, your power stat minus 2, he has 5 power. So 3 dice, as long as you get 1 success, you choose an ally within 12 inches and teleport them adjacent to him. So he teleported, there's the 2 successes he got on the roll, whoops, I knocked it but it was a 4. So he teleported Trapjaw adjacent to him, and that is 2 mana spent. He spent one on his passive called Lord of Destruction. Well, it's not passive, you have to activate it, but it's active until the end of the round. Until the end of the round, or rather the current activation, Skeletor can use ranged attacks while engaged. Obviously, that's not going to be any use, but you're allowed to spend it. So that's three spent. And now he's going to do two magical blasts, which normally would cost one mana each, which would be the five. Um, but because he's doing two magic actions in a row, the second one should cost two EP, instead of one, because it goes up, since you're doing the same attack again. And that is being circumvented by playing another fate card. You only get to pick between the special rules on them. You don't get any of this stuff up here. And he is picking, during this activation or interruption, man, uh, magic attacks cost one less action point to a minimum of one. So we're just covering this now, so I can just show you the result of the dice in a second. But that means the first magic blast is only using up one AP. The second one, which would normally cost two, has been reduced down to also one AP, which means that's his three AP used up as efficiently as possible. And he might even get to kill He-Man in the process, we'll see. The game doesn't come with enough dice to uh, just show you all the dice that were rolled, so we'll just cover the result. The first attack for magic spells, you do uh, attacker's power stat versus defender's mind stat. So it was five dice versus three both times. First attack got two successes through. Part of the spell, that means it just does one damage, so it just replace the, the two singles with a, a one three there for him. And the second attack had one success after defense rolls, and one success on the magic blast spell does zero. You need at least two successes to do damage. So He-Man is hurting, he's only got two health left, but he did manage to withstand Skeletor blasting him twice there, and using up that extra fate card as well. But he did still spend a total of 5 mana in his turn, so as Skeletor's turn ends, they have gained 10 victory points from this side objective. I feel like this tutorial mission is designed so that a big fight happens in the middle, hence the like, borders here. But anyway, Stratos activated for the good guys. This is the fake card used. 3 AP, 2 MP. During his activation, he's not allowed to perform the focus action, and he... First of all, used the 2 MP given to do the, what is it called, F uh, to the sky, which let him fly, which presumably negates the climbing down. If that's wrong, apologies, but it seems like it should, because he's flying. If that's wrong, apologies, but he bounced down to roughly here or wherever, and then he did a movement action, one, two, three, four, five, whoops, right to where you can see him. And that means he has one AP left, and he is going to use that flamethrower of his for his final action. It's a ranged attack. Now, there is a choice. He could do it on Merman, but if he did it on Trapjaw or Skeletor, it hits every enemy within... Actually, it hits all characters. Hang on. It doesn't specify enemies. It affects the target and all characters within two. Oh, Merman is too close. He'd get hit, so would He-Man. He's going to have to do it on Trapjaw, so it only hits Skeletor as well. Um, but... It does have a special rule where targets defense tests only succeed on a roll of a six. He needs to get two successes of his own to at least do one damage, and if he gets three, he can do two damage max. So it's it's pretty good. We'll have to roll that out separately. I think you roll separately for each person in terms of the attack roll. 
So we'll see how much damage he can do to trap John Skelter. That is a shame though. So it does affect friendlies as well. So I was hoping to try and work on working towards killing Merman, but that's not going to be uh, possible with that. And after all that was rolled out, he did a single point of damage to Trapjaw, and he only got one success through against Skeletor, who did roll a six on his toughness defense, and as a result that does nothing. Needed at least two. Merman was up for the baddies, is playing this card to get three AP during his activation or interruption. If he did at least uh, two successes or more, he gains one mana. He attacked twice uh, against He-Man, just trying to take him out, and just not bothering with focus because if both attacks did at least one damage, which only required one success getting through, he would have killed him. First attack got precisely one success through, and the roll for the second set of attacks is actually there. Now, does he still gain mana? If this character's attack results in two or more successes, no, so it has to get through his defense. So, no, the first attack only had one success. Second one, He-Man squared up to him, thankfully flexed his muscles, and took no damage, but he's only got one health left now, which is not great. Things are not looking good for the forces of good. Mana Arms activated, this is the fake card played, 2 AP, 1 MP, and he took during this activation or interruption of the character's attack results in four or more successes, he can gain an extra action point. He moved up five to where you can see him, and then he had a choice. Um, his arm cannon is range 12, so he could have absolutely shot at Trap Jaw or Skeletor who would have had cover. But he opted to shoot at Merman. You can shoot at characters who are engaged in combat, close combat, in this game. But unlike Fallout, where it's actually easier to shoot into a melee, it's harder in this game. I guess to show that they're like picking their shots carefully. So the scope becomes one worse, meaning he was hitting on fives. He did roll two natural fives. He then spent two mana on two rerolls to try for more. And that's the reroll result. So he got nothing there. He was looking for four because it would have done two damage. And Merman just absolutely aced his uh, defense roll. Rolled three fives and took no damage as a result. So that is real bad. And that is turn two done for the goodies. It's over to Trapjaw to end off the round. Well, Trapjaw the cheeky so-and-so went for the Hail Maryest of Hail Mary plays. This is the other glory card in the curated deck it tells you to use for the villains. And it has a secondary, well, first of all, it gives him 2 AP, 1 MP, and it gives him the secondary chance to score some victory points, which he took. Use a ranged attack to knock out an enemy. So he was trying for the kill shot on He-Man, which would have got him 20 off of that, plus 25-ish for just taking He-Man off the table. As it turns out, though, well, he only had 2 AP to play with, so he gave himself a focus token. And then he initiated a ranged attack into combat, so the focus token kind of counteracts the negative to shooting into combat. So it would have become 5 plus, it's back down to 4 plus. He only got two successes. He-Man also got two successes. So holding on by the skin of his teeth, he lived. And this card is discarded. So until the deck gets reshuffled, and I don't, with so few characters, I don't think it's gonna to get to that point in a four round game. This card can't come back around, most likely. So those 20 points that he was trying for there, they're, they're just gone. Um, but he man's still probably going to go down in the next round, but he, if they can get initiative, they will be able to get one more use out of him. Maybe he can actually take out Merman. Who knows? I was about to go straight into the top of the penultimate round. However, yes, he man is not holding that objective because he has an enemy adjacent to him. But Stratos, who moved adjacent to that objective, does not have an enemy adjacent to him. And the objective itself does not have an enemy adjacent or on, as it turns out, you can stand on them. Uh, adjacent or on it. So he is holding that objective. So the good guys actually did score 20 more victory points at the end of that round. Round three of four. Let's see what is happening. A glory card is being spent by the good guys and that is twice the initiative value of the one played by Team Evil. So it'll be this and obviously it's going to be He-Man. And the side mission on this, worth 20, is use a melee attack to knock out an enemy, aka kill, because none of these games are allowed to say kill. But that's what he's going to be trying to do. So we know the card being played, however, another one is being played. You can play additional fake cards before or after conducting an action. So this one has been played to give He-Man a focus, which in turn gives him 1 MP, and doesn't cost any AP or anything because it's free from the card. He spent one of those 2 AP from this card to do a melee attack into Merman. 
He had that focus token, which means the scope became 3 plus instead of 4 plus. He had 4 successes originally. He spent his 1 MP to reroll and got a 6, which means he got through with all 5. Merman rolled 1 success at first. He spent 1 MP he had on a reroll and managed to get 2 successes, which means in total there is oops, 3 successes. And with the Sword of Power, that is 2 damage. So I'm just going to take away one of those 1s and replace it with a 3. That means Merman's alive on one health. Now, He-Man still has one AP left, but he would need to spend two to do another melee attack. So I'm going to look at options and then be back in a second. No, unfortunately, none of the cards in hand allow him to do like a, a cheaper attack action. He has no other options. But because he got that original focus just from playing a fate card, doing a fate point of his own is still just one AP. So he's doing that. That means he'll get a better scope on his defense test once. Um, and also give him one mana automatically because of superhuman reflexes, which can also give him two rerolls. So that might make him survive at least one round of attacks. We'll see. Well, try as I might, He-Man has fallen. Merman is using that card that was played. Two action points plus one mana. He is taking the extra action point because the goal was he, he'll get two attacks. And that would surely be enough to get one damage through against He-Man. He rolled fantastically on the initial attack roll. Three sixes and a five. He-Man also rolled fantastically. But that focus token just makes the scope of his defense better. It doesn't give him uh, any extra. So unfortunately he's not... Well, he's fully blocked three. One still gets through. That does one damage. And that means he is out of there. The mighty He-Man has fallen. So when that happens, Team Evil gain victory points equal to him and any equipment. Now that's at the back of this book if you're curious. He-Man's worth 19 and his Sword of Power is worth 3. So that is 22 victory points gained by Team Evil. And Merman still has 2 EP left. And it's a bit hard to see him, but he scarpered. He spent 1 focus, or rather 1 EP, sorry, to give himself focus. And then used that focus to sprint 8 hexes which got him all the way over here around the corner. He's just trying to not give up points. Yes, he's giving up the middle objective, but Trapjaw and Skeletor can obviously go for that, so he's just trying to deny the points he's worth. Stratos had to try and avenge He-Man using this card for 2 AP, 2 MP, and taking a third MP from the bonus rules for it. He moved 5, which gave him clear line of sight with that range 8 flamethrower, and he initiated felonious Assault. 5 dice for Perception versus 3 Toughness, uh, just the two successes from Merman got left there. That was after spending MP on a reroll. Also, uh, Stratos spent one MP on a reroll too, just to, he needed as many successes as possible, and got four through, which was reduced down to two, but that's still a single point of damage, which means that Merman is out of there. Merman plus his trident equals 22 victory points gained for the good side. Now, unfortunately for Stratos, he has exposed his back currently. However, even though he's out of AP, he is spending his other 2 MP onto the sky again. And he's going 1-2. And he's facing this way now. So it's a bit harder to get at his flank. And that seems pretty good. Trapjaw decided to ignore Man-at-Arms and instead... Uh, sorry, ignore Stratos and go after Man-at-Arms. Playing this card, which has an issue of 1 on it. Good grief. 2 action points, 1 MP. He was hoping to do lots of damage to gain another action point and mana. But that didn't work out. He moved up to touch the objective, however, and then used that laser attachment to shoot at Man at Arms, spending two rerolls and getting a total of four successes. Man at Arms would roll four dice. Uh, the other one isn't there just because it was a failure and he didn't have any MP. For oh no, he sorry, he did buy a reroll and it became a success. So he blocked three in total, meaning only one got through for a single point of damage. Man at Arms played this card giving himself 2 AP, 1 MP and also during his activation he can do a focus action that costs 1 less to a minimum of 0 so he did a free focus action essentially. He moved adjacent to the objective and trap jaw and struck out at him with his mace. So with the focus token it was down to 3 pluses required and he rolls 4 dice and he had 2 successes. He spent 1 mana to reroll and got nothing so still just 2 successes and Trapjaw turns out his weakness is defense rolls. He only rolls two defense, but he rolled really well here and cancelled out both those successes. Had the mace done at least two successes, he pushes back the target, which would have let them claim the objective for the round, but oh well. Now it's over to Skeletor to end the round. 
So Skeletor ended up all the way up there. He played this card for 2 AP plus 2 MP is uh, no optional choice here. It's just 2 MP. And he started with a Magic Blast into Stratos from where he was. The special rule of Magic Blast that I didn't discuss before because it didn't come up. If the target has less mana than the attacker after you spend the mana for the spell, which is just one, you gain two dice, which means Skeletor rolls seven dice. So that's why the dice aren't sitting, because there isn't enough dice in the game to cover that plus the defense roll. So he was rolling seven, and Stratos did okay with his three defense dice. One success, or sorry, two successes got through all said and done, but that's still just one singular point of damage. He spent the other AP on a move just to try and get close to that backline objective to stop Stratos scoring it in the final round. So that is it, and that takes us to the end of the penultimate round. And as we go into round four of four, nothing is scoring in this end phase because this objective here is contested. Neither Skeletor nor Stratos are at that one, although Skeletor can't cap it because it's in his deployment zone anyway. So we're still going into the final round with the good side ahead by quite a lot, but the evil side could still turn it around, although both sides have kind of lost their beat sticks, so I don't know, we'll see what happens. So here we are at the top of round four, the final round of the game. Unfortunately, I noticed a pretty big uh, rules omission. This vying for initiative is not just for the initial activation of a round. You're actually supposed to do it for every single activation. Way too used to just having to vie for control at the start of a round and then, you know, alternating activations. So that is uh, probably the biggest rules error we've done. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, this final round will be done correctly. But can't go back now, obviously we're right at the end of the game. So anyway, good guys are playing a initiative 2. And that is an initiative 5, but this is a chance to earn some victory points. One of your characters ends move action in enemy deployment zone. Well, that's pretty easy for Stratos, because I'm pretty sure he's already in there. He just needs to move one hex, and that would count, I presume. So, I guess Skeletor, because, yeah, uh, Trapjot isn't going to be able to get to him. There is um, a tax of opportunity if you disengage from combat in this game. So... We'll, uh, it's got to be Skeletor to try and kill him. Yeah, there, there's no other option for him, really. It's all the way up there at the tippy top of the table. Skeletor took the third action point, and that let him do a spell attack action, a move into close combat, and then an attack action. Uh, each of a different ranged, or attack type, sorry, close combat, ranged combat, magic combat, all count as separate types, as far as I'm aware. So, well, I hope that's right. Anyway... The spell attack action, dice aren't there anymore because of how many Skeletor gets to roll. He managed to get two successes through, I believe, which equaled one extra damage, taking Stratos to three wounds. And then, unfortunately for him, he took one more damage in melee from the Havoc Staff. Skeletor rolls four in the close combat, and Stratos is just rolling two defense against a non-magic attack. And that one extra damage means four health in total. That's how much he has. So he is out of there. And what is he worth? Let's see. Stratos is worth 17, but plus his flamethrower, that is 2. So he's worth 19. And now obviously isn't getting an activation. So Man at Arms has to work with the card in play, and they're pretty far ahead. And if he just stayed at that objective, even if he boops Trapjaw away, which is actually what he did, we'll cover that in a second. Trapjaw hasn't activated yet, so he can just walk back on and contest at the very least. So, he had 3 AP to play with, and opted to swing his mace into Trapjaw, getting 2 successes. Trapjaw with his defence, had no MP with which to reroll, and as a result took 1 damage, and was pushed back 2 hexes right there. Then, and this has already been measured out, he has 2 AP left, he's spending 1 on a focus, and then doing a dash, which is 8 hexes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, takes him right there. And that is inside the enemy deployment zone, just. We can see that right here. That That's where he is, he's on that hex. The darkened area is the enemy deployment zone, which means as he ends that move in action, he does score 10. Now that means it's easy for Trapjaw to score 20, but they're ahead by more than that 10 difference, so I think that's more than secured the win just now because Man at Arms is at full health and he has 5 as well. So we'll still play Trapjaw's activation, but I'm pretty sure that cinched the win there.
So yeah, Trapjaw, it doesn't matter what card he's playing, he's just going to do movement onto this central objective and that's the end of the round there. So that means at the end of the round he's scoring 20 right there and we'll go to the final scores and go over who's won. So again, keep in mind as we reach the end of the game here, obviously there was a massive mistake in that you're supposed to do uh, that fighting for initiative on every activation, not just the first of a round. But didn't do that here, forgot it first, but then just kept it consistent for the rest of the video. But that is obviously a big mistake and that could have affected the outcome of certain interactions. I don't think for the most part it did because I feel like there was a lot of times it was very disparate between the initiative amounts, but it could be wrong. We'll know via editing, but that's obviously a big mistake. Also, uh, Hubris is a play here. Thought the good guys were massively ahead. But not really. In the early rounds they got a couple of objective scores with He-Man and then Stratos for 40. Then they took out Merman for 21 and they scored 10 there at the end with that side objective. Meaning that they scored 71. The bad guys, they took out He-Man who's worth 22. They took out, uh, they did one of their objectives rather for 10. They took out Stratos who's worth 19. And right at the end there, they scored 20 for holding an objective. So they also scored 71. So it's actually a draw. So that's the fairest outcome, I guess, considering there was a bit of a mess up with fighting for initiative each time. If one side runs out of activations before the other, I believe you don't, obviously, you don't vie for objective or initiative, sorry. And each attack type does count separately for the purposes of going up in EP cost as well. Double check that. But... Errors aside, that is a general amateur playthrough of Masters of the Universe Battleground um, using the content of the two player starter set and using the tutorial battle which is less characters overall usually it's 5 on 5 roughly speaking or slightly less but you've like, given them a bunch of extra gear using the curated decks as well and the curated decks seem to fit the theme of the characters so it, it seemed fine to me. So. Now is the time where you can take to the comments and see whether you are for or against more of this on the channel in general. Um, obviously we can at least see the rest of the starter box if nothing else. There is different map layouts as well, it's not you know, random or whatever. The Battleground book has a bunch of different setups for objectives and such. That's where you find the points on the back. So there is more to see, different objective placements, different deployments I think. So do let me know what you think in the comments. And we'll maybe see this again in the future soonish. Thank you for watching either way. Please do remember to show your support just in general. And if you can spare it, go above and beyond and consider becoming a channel member. You get access to certain videos early and potentially check out the channel sponsor if you do so via the affiliate link and buy something for yourself. I also get compensated. So we both benefit. Either way, enjoy the rest of your day and I will see you in the future for something else. Until then, ta-ta for now.